faithful to us. I tell you, I want to strive my best in these last of the last days to be faithful to him. Preacher, thank you so much for everything. Appreciate the invite, the, the rooms over at Moriah, the houses over at Moriah Baptist. We appreciate them. The meal last night, the meal today, and and uh, just just the opportunity to be here. We sure do love you, love your church, love the church family here. And uh, a lot of years we've been coming, and I tell you, we, we're thankful for the faithfulness of Elizabeth Terry. Sure appreciate y'all. Revelation chapter number one, Revelation chapter number one, I'll go ahead and preface this message by saying I am not a prophecy preacher. I, I, the, the only sure thing that I know about prophecy as of right now is the Lord's coming. I do know that. And uh, there's nothing left on God's prophetic timetable, nothing left on the calendar of God to do except come and get the church out of here. And we're looking forward to that day, looking forward to the rapture. But, but uh, if you want to understand prophecy and whatever mess I made last night, whatever mess I'll make this morning, Brother Buster, you just straighten it out when you get up here tonight and, and uh, it'll all be wiped clean after, after the service tonight. Dr. Kenzie will come up and, and uh, he will straighten all this out. But I just want to give you a few thoughts. I, I expressed to you last night how that I was, my mom self-diagnosed me with the ADD. And preacher, honest to goodness, my mind wanders and it goes from, from way over yonder to way over yonder to way back yonder. I mean, just my, my attention span is, is little to none. I mean, I can be trying to focus on, on just about anything in my life and, and just start to wander, just catch things and see things and think things. And, and man, one of my biggest, uh, I guess, uh, things that I like and I think about quite a bit is, is the idea of flying. 
I mean, preacher, I just love to see, we, we go by most of the major airports in the country quite a bit, and, and we can be going through Houston, or we can be going through Atlanta, came up through Atlanta yesterday, and I mean, those, those big old planes coming right across the, the interstate. Brother Buster, it's always amazed me how those big old gigantic pieces of equipment, all the weight that's just in the plane itself, and then all the luggage that they put on it, all the fuel they put on it, and all them not so skinny people that they put on there. I wonder how in the world, I guess I don't understand G-forces, I don't understand physics all that well, but it always amazes me, preacher, how all those thousands seemingly of pounds and tons can just come down a runway about two, three hundred miles an hour and then take off and then get up airborne, fly up 30,000 feet. And then I, that just amazes me yeah. Yeah. how that is. I'm, I'm driving the bus sometimes and we pass these major airports and I'm hollering at my seven-year-old, Mally, come up here and see this big old plane. Oh, Dad, I've seen thousands. <laughs> but it amazes me. This idea of, of uh, and most of the young people sitting, sitting in the auditorium today, you'll, you'll have no idea what I'm talking about, but that old cartoon, The Jetsons. Yeah. Yeah. I'd always thought, wouldn't that be the coolest thing to roll out of bed onto your conveyor belt on your house? And I mean, that thing just run you right through the shower. I mean, strips your clothes off, runs you right through the shower, throws your clothes on, Brother Buster, runs you by uh, the breakfast table, runs you right by your wife. She gives you a little smack on the lips, runs you by your little robot maid named Rosie. Rosie gives you your briefcase, a big old hole opens up, and you drop down in the comforts of your, of your flying car that carries you across the, the airways to work. I mean, that kind of stuff amazes me. This idea of Captain Kurt and the old Star Trek stuff. I mean, we'd watch that show when I was a kid and Captain Kirk would be on that distant planet preacher, him and Mr. Spock and all the rest of them, Brother Buster and the enemy on that planet, whatever it was, an alien, a monster, whatever, was about to have Captain Kirk right in his grasp. And Captain Kirk would always hit that little button on his chest and say, beam me up, Scotty. And then he'd evaporate into about a billion pieces. And next thing you know, they're showing him on that spaceship. I mean, the, all the pieces coming back together and there's not an ear out of place. Not a, I mean, that kind of stuff is amazing to me. This idea of time travel. I know I'll never be smart enough nor rich enough. But if I could pay somebody to invent a time machine, preacher. Somebody smart enough to do it. That, there, there might be one out there in, the, in days to come. I have no idea, but, but if I could pay somebody to let me just jump ahead about 20 years, Brother Buster. Just, just 20 years is all I'd want to jump ahead. Find whatever stocks are booming 20 years down the road. Come back to today Grab what little measly fare I could get, what measly little bank account I could get, Brother Buster. Invest it in that stock and watch myself over 20 years become a gazillionaire. Yeah. Yeah. Don't tell me y'all ain't never thought about that. <laughs> or um, jump ahead that same 20 years, find a, a, a high-rise, multi-megaplex of a city or... or or a shopping center or whatever and come back today that I know that land is swamp land or I know that land is marshland or just to feel. Try everything I could to buy up that piece of land and sell it and just make millions of dollars. This idea of, this is going to be real, real carnal, but a lot of Baptist people probably find out 20 years of lottery numbers and buy tickets and hit the winning number just like that. If we could see what's ahead and come back to today every one of us would make changes that's the carnal stuff preacher what about I, I, th I think about my wife has two son-in-laws I got two daughters and we got a grandbaby and she's got two daughters and a grandbaby but she's got the addition of two son-in-laws we'll discuss that later but jump ahead 20 years. Brother Buster, see how that son-in-law is treating my daughter. And honest to goodness, if I don't like it, 
come back to today, take that dude fishing without a rod and reel, and them grandbabies. I thank the Lord, preacher. We got a, a good-looking grandson. But, you know, before I, the grandson was born, Brother Buster, I was thinking, what's that grandkid going to look like? Surely we don't want him looking like his daddy. <laughs> Stuff because, I mean, people say there ain't no such thing as ugly grandkids. I've seen some ugly grandkids. There are such a thing. But that's the, the carnal stuff. But what about the spiritual stuff? 20 years down the road. We come on this last weekend of June to the Elizabeth Terrace Baptist Church. And preacher, we find ourselves hopefully find ourselves sitting in the same spot, a wife beside us, maybe some kids beside us, some grandkids, great-grandkids beside us, and we start talking to ourselves. And we ask ourselves, well, where's your son, or where's your grandson, or where's your daughter and her family? And the answers could be really good. Oh, they surrendered to the, the call to be missionaries. They're somewhere in Africa. They're somewhere over in China. They're in, in the Middle East. They're somewhere. They're serving the Lord faithful. Got a great work going. Or the Lord's called, to, called them to preach. They're pastoring the church. A lot of the answers may be really, really good. But some of them may not be so good. Where's your son? Where's your daughter? Where's your grandkids that used to sit by you? Where's your wife or your husband? And we might hear ourselves say, well, 15 years ago, this came up, and I didn't act exactly right. I didn't say the right thing. I didn't present myself in a godly way, and it made them leave the church, or it made them get out of the will of God, or... I promise you, every one of us would come back to today. And Brother Buster, when that opportunity arose in our lives, we'd do different. We'd act different. We'd have a different response. We'd have a different conversation. If everybody could see just a few years down the road how things was going to be, we'd all come back and make some changes. Every one of us would. This passage here in the book of the Revelation, to be honest, John has already seen the future. The future's already been predicted. And I know us Baptists will say that we believe the book of the Revelation, and, and we do. It's in the Word of God. We believe it to be the Bible. We, we believe everything in Revelation preaching is going to take place. But I believe Baptists and most independent fundamental Bible-believing Baptist churches, Brother Buster, think this book, book of the Revelation is somewhere way, 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 way out there. We know what's going to happen, but I believe most Baptist churches in America today believe that the things that are going to take place in the book of the Revelation, oh, that's something way, 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 way out yonder. But in reality, the things that take place here in the book of the Revelation, preacher, could be, could start unfolding before 12 o'clock noon. It could start unfolding, Brother Buster, before the service tonight. And the Bible made, made statements like this. John said over and over and over again in this book of the Revelation, I looked and I beheld and I saw. I looked and I beheld and I saw. Time and time again, John makes that statement. And what amazes me is John looked all the way past to where time stopped. And John says, I'm seeing things over in eternity. I'm seeing a lot of future things. Look at it with me. Revelation chapter 1, verse number 1. The Bible says, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. And this is my text right here. Who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. And if we could grasp a hold 
as members of the Elizabeth Terrace Baptist Church, as preachers, Buster, you and I, and the pastor, and, and many of you in the building, if we could just grasp a hold of just a handful of things that John saw and came back and wrote about and told us about, this place would probably be full next Sunday. If we just grasp a hold of just a few things that John says, I looked and I beheld and I saw, I promise you every child of God in the building would do their best to get their loved ones in. We'd do our best to tell people about these last of the last days and what's gonna take place. We would live different as far as the church is concerned. We'd live different as far as our family's concerned. We'd do some things different as far as witnessing and giving the gospel to this lost and dying world. If we just grasp a hold of just a few things that John saw, there wouldn't be an empty seat in the auditorium, maybe even tonight. You say, well, what did John see? Number one, John says, I looked and I beheld and I saw, number one, a Savior, the Savior, and he's still on the throne. Chapter number four, preacher, John says, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, verse number two, and he said, I saw a throne that was set in heaven and, and from that throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and, and the cherubims and the seraphims and the elders. They sat round about the throne, Brother Buster, and they're hollering, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, and they're saying, worthy is the Lamb. And John said, there was one that sat on the throne, the only one worthy to sat on the throne, the only one worthy to take that place on the throne of God and John says I've already looked out into eternity I've looked all the way to where time stopped and I want to give you some, some news today that Savior is still in control that Savior is still the great God Almighty that Savior is still seated on the throne in heaven he is still there John says I've seen him he's not resigned He's not giving up the throne. He's, they've not abdicated him. He's not giving up. They've not impeached him. He's the only one that can sit on the throne. He's the only one that can occupy the throne in heaven and rest assured, child of God, if we just take that to heart, a lot of our worries that's going on in this world around us, we'd be able to have a little more ease and a little more rest and a little more faith knowing that God is not, none of this is taking him by surprise. God is still seated. Seated on the throne just as he was when he took his seat and sat down at the right hand of the Father. He's still on the throne today. John says, I've looked all the way out there in eternity and I see him. He's still there. He said, you take ease. Everything that's going on in, the, in this world today, it was told that it was going to happen. It should take none of us by surprise. You say, well, everything that happens, there's something new every day, and there he is. But don't think God don't know. Don't think God ain't in control. Don't think the great puppet master is not running things on this earth. Oh, sure, there is a prince of power in the air, but he's got just a little power, and our God has all power, and God can do whatever God wants to do. He is still seated on the throne in heaven. John says, I've looked way out there. And he's there. He said, I saw that throne in heaven. And what a wonderful sight that John saw. If you and I just grasp a hold of that, I promise you, we'd worry a whole lot less. We wouldn't worry about all that's going on in Washington. We wouldn't worry about all that's going on across this world. We wouldn't worry about anything. If we just rest assured in the fact that God is still on his throne. He still is in charge. God is running things. But not only, John says, I saw the Savior still on the throne. But number two, John says, I looked and I beheld and I saw a sure judgment that's coming. I've read after guys, seemingly all my life, preacher, and there's not one person, Brother Buster, maybe, maybe you can straighten this out after I say it, but I don't know of one person, dead or alive, preacher, that studied that Bible through and through that can give me an accurate picture of where America is in the last days. I don't know, Brother Buster. I, I've, I've, I've heard some guys who had some ideas, 
I've heard some guys who said they thought this could be it. Daniel represent. I guess Daniel speaks about the eagle. And somebody said that could be a picture. I don't know. I don't know that there's any mention of America in the last days in Scripture. But like I said, I, I, don't, I don't know a lot of things, preacher. So if you know, you straighten it out tonight after, I'm, after we're gone. Or you fulfill me. You let me know. I want to know. But I told the preacher last night, I'm, I'm not a big conspiracy theorist. I read all this stuff, but... My ideas of not, not this past election, but the election before. Yeah. I honestly thought the female was going to win. The woman was going to win. Yeah. Yeah. That was my idea. I'm thinking she's going to win. She's going to sell us to some Muslim country. We're all going to be wearing turbans speaking Arabic. That's what I thought. But that didn't happen. I believe God gave us a space of grace. And I don't have a clue... What's going to happen with this administration? To, to be honest, I believe the reason why we can't find American scripture preachers is I believe America finally turns her back on the nation of Israel. Yeah. Yeah. And God says, I'm done with you. Yeah. And I don't know what happens to her, but I believe she's wiped out. I believe she's sold into, into some form. I, I don't know, Brother Buster, but I believe America finally turns her back on Israel. And God judges this land for turning against his chosen people. But that's just my thinking. I don't, I don't know where America is in Scripture, preacher, but I do know where the church is. I do know where we are as the body of believers. I do know that in 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4, the Bible says in, in a moment in the twinkling of an eye, the trump of God is going to sound. The dead in Christ is going to rise first. Then we which are alive and going to be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we be with the Lord. And you go ahead and say, yeah, you, I'm one of those that believe in a literal rapture, Brother Buster. I'm one of those that believe in a literal snatching away. You say, well, the word rapture is not in the Bible. The word Bible is not in the Bible. But I believe that we have a Bible. And I believe there's going to be a rapture. I believe the church of God. One of these days when God says, I'm done, I believe we're going to be snatched out of here by force. And I believe we're going to rule and reign with him forever and forever. I don't know where America is in the last days, but I do know where the church is. And if you're left here after chapter number four, chapter number five, and that great effectual door that's open in heaven is closed, Brother Buster, there's no hope for you. I don't know all about the two witnesses. I honestly believe that's all to the Jews. I don't know about the 144,000, Brother. I don't, I don't know all about that. I probably need to study a little more than I do. But I believe all that's in relation to the Jew, to God's chosen people. But I do believe that if the rapture takes place and you're left here, I don't believe you'll have a chance to be saved. I believe that chance has faded away and you'll have to spend eternity in hell. But God says there's going to be a judgment. John says, I've looked and saw it. I believe there's going to be a judgment of this earth. Revelation chapter number 6 and, and following, Brother Buster, talks about the trumpets and the seals and the dooms and the four horsemen and all that's going to take place. And it's not going to be a pleasant thing. And the Bible says that men, women, boys, and girls are going to be asking to die. They're going to be begging the mountains to fall on them. They're going to try to kill themselves with swords and guns and they would not be able to die. They're going to have to go through every second of the great tribulation of all the vials being opened and all the judgment being poured out on this earth. God says, I'm going to judge this earth for the wickedness and the sin of Adam. I'm going to judge this earth for the wickedness of man. I'm going to judge this earth. And John says, you rest assured, it's already going to happen. I know it is. The judgment of this earth, but not only the judgment of this earth, the great white throne. I preach, I don't know where we'll be. I don't have any idea if we're going to be in a grandstand watching. I don't have a clue where we're going to be, Brother Buster, when God decides to judge from every kindred and every nation, every tongue and every tribe, when the dead, small and great, are gathered before him at the great white. I don't have a clue where we're going to be. But there may be family members that you know 
that you have, co-workers and neighbors that you've known for years and years and years may have to stand at this great white throne and give an account for their sin. Why have they rejected the Lord Jesus Christ and the blood he shed on Calvary? And I don't know, preacher, that we'll be standing, but I have no idea, but it would be a shame, Brother Buster, to have a family member stand there at that great white throne, hear those words, depart from me, and they point up to us in that grandstand. If we're on looking and they say why didn't you tell me why didn't you warn me why didn't you let me know that there's a heaven to gain and a hell to shut because lost people are going to have to stand before this great white throne that makes me want to give the gospel to everybody they know they'll have no excuse they'll have no chance to even make it to heaven they're already doomed and damned for that place called hell the lake of fire which is the second death Chapter number 20, I believe it is, the book of the Revelation. John says, it's going to take place. It's going to happen. The great white throne is going to happen. The judgment at the great white throne is going to happen. That's going to be for the lost, but preacher, the judgment seat of Christ is going to take place too. And as a child of God, this ought to shake every one of us to our core. A lot of guys think it's going to be a picnic. Oh, oh, we're saved. We're going to make it to heaven. We're as fit for heaven as if we're already there. But preacher, we're going to have to give an account, not for our sins. That was taken care of when we accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior. That was a done deal. I don't have to worry about him telling me, depart from me and being cast into the lake of fire. I don't have to worry about going to hell. But I'm going to have to stand before him at the judgment seat of Christ and give an account since the day I got saved for every deed, every action, every word, every moment motive, every reaction, every thought, I'm going to have to give an account. Yes. Yes. And that ought to shake us to the core. Yes. Yes. And just the fact that it's going to happen, and I believe God's word is going to say it's going to happen, preacher. It makes me want to be a better preacher. It makes me want to be a better husband. makes me want to be a better dad. makes me want to be a, a better witness for the cause of Christ because I'm going to have to stand before. Nobody can stand beside me and, and plead my case. Nobody can, can take the blame for the things I've done. Nobody can take the blame for my thoughts and my actions when my life is portrayed in front of God himself and he's going to ask me, why did you and why didn't you? I'm going to have to be the one. And I believe a lot of people are going to leave that great or that judgment seat of Christ with their heads bowed low. We're going to make it in. We're fit for heaven. We're going to make it in, preacher. But this is not going to be a walk in the park. And honest to goodness, it ought to make every one of us want to go out and tell this lost and dying world there's a heaven to gain and a hell to shun. It ought to make us want to fill these pews up day in and day out and week in and week out telling people there is a Christ, the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ and he wants to save you away from the great white throne. He wants to make you part of the kingdom of heaven because there's going to be a judgment seat that every one of us that's saved is going to have to stand before and John says it's going to happen. I've looked. I beheld And I saw the judgment, the sure judgment that's coming. But number three, John says, I looked and I beheld and I saw not only the Savior still on the throne, not only the sure judgment that's coming, but John says, I looked and I beheld and I saw Satan. And he said, Satan is doomed and defeated. We ought to run laps on that right there. I don't know how many times seemingly we've got on that bus. And Brother Buster, I know we can't be possessed by the devil and possessed by his demons, but I believe we can be oppressed. I believe he can jump on our backs and just whisper those, those where's your God now statements and why are you serving God that's let you down? Why are you serving God? And the devil that's went after our kids and the devil that's attacked our families and attacked our homes and attacked our churches and attacked the man of God. One of these days, church, we'll not have to worry about him 
him. The Bible talks about a land of no more. And I'm glad one of these days there'll be no more sin in heaven. I'm glad there'll be no more sickness and no more sorrow and no more suffering. But I'm glad one of these days there'll not be a Satan that we'll have to deal with. The Bible says he is doomed and defeated. Yes. Yes. Revelation chapter 19, 20, 21. The Bible says, and Satan himself.